record on this computer. It said recording on my end. Okay. No. All right. Awesome. I think I'm, I'm recording now. So um, thanks so much for joining, guys. We've already had a little chance to chat here. I wanted to get four great minds together to talk about one of the most unusual years in sport we've ever had. Obviously, that even has a huge impact, even bigger impact that this year was meant to be the Tokyo Olympics. So it's like, feels even greater, but it's a, it trickles right down through professional ranks, amateur ranks, right down to beginners and then kids and right down to, you know, through collegiate sports, um, school sports, all that kind of stuff. So I feel like there's been a lot of talk amongst athletes and, and a lot of information out there. And I've seen everything from A to Z on different ways to, to manage athletes and programs and coaching through this time. But the reality is, is this is like un, unchar uncharted territory, like none of us really know. And the most interesting thing I think will be when it all comes to some kind of an end, whatever that end is, who, who did the right things? And I mean, do we know what the right things are? And I really wanted to get us together to chat about I've put out some particular topics that we'll cover, but how do we help young coaches manage this time period? How do we help athletes manage this time period? How do we help just in general in sport managing programs and, and come out of this, you know, with athletes healthy, um, still ready to compete? What is sport going to look like from a mental perspective, a health perspective, progression, um, what are some of the major pitfalls that we can see in our responsibility as coaches? Mostly, I think as coaches, we, you know, we have such a huge impact on direction of athletes' lives, not only like their day-to-day -day life, their personal life, their health, but their long-term life, especially if you're working with kids. And um, so what's our responsibility as coaches to direct them in the right way, mentally, physically, emotionally, and, and what that's going to look like long-term for them, you know, down the road as we go through this period. Um, so Justin, we have you, you're Ironman champion. You've been a professional athlete, athlete for, you know, over a decade, 41 Ironman finishes, Kona qualifier, um, endurance corner, business owner, coach Kona qualifiers, professional athletes, um, over top, you know, top 10 finishes. You've had, you know, probably 40 of those 41 races, but you, you know, <laughs> yeah. you've had, a, yeah, I've, I've raced a lot, podium, yeah. raced a lot. So a lot of experience, a lot of experience coaching, a lot of experience racing at a high level as well as still racing at a high level. So I, I'm really excited to have you here because you're, you know, you're one of those athletes that's, you're still racing professionally. And so, you know, you're, you've got a completely different perspective than if you're just purely coaching or, um, you know, some of, some of the other perspectives out there. Kurt, you've been a longtime coach for over 30 years, worked with amateurs, professionals, um, all kinds of kids programs, you know, different sports. And so, again, getting a, another perspective in there in terms of, you know, managing right down from kids all the way up to 75 year olds and, and what that's going to look like, yeah. you know, making sure that they come out of this healthy and successful. And you manage a group of coaches. So you're also <laughs> not only managing the athletes and your, your own programming, but you're having to guide and direct um, a group of coaches in the right direction on how to manage their athletes. So really interested to hear your input. And then Matt, you come from the strength and conditioning world and we've talked about the, the different differences between the endurance world and what the strength sports are doing and the amount of, comp you know, competitions actually are available for strength athletes. So we've talked about how that's maybe been a little bit easier to manage, but you know, with the Olympics, being postponed till 2021, you've been a Olympics trials coach, uh, national team coach, an Olympic trials athlete yourself. You know, you've been you've been coaching kids programs. You've track and field head coach for 5,000 kids. You know, you name it. I'll let you guys introduce yourselves a little bit more, so you have some insight on on what that looks like. And and can you know, you've been coaching for 30 plus years as well, so I have really good long term vision and long term vision on development. So. Thank you for your time. Maybe say a little bit extra about yourself. Um, Kurt, go ahead and start with yourself if you have anything to add that I missed there um, before we start the, the conversation rolling on the topics. Yeah, I want to get right to it. I mean, you, you hit me on the head. I, the analogy I use often is my knowledge is like two meters wide, but 15 feet deep. You know, like I don't know much about marketing or bookkeeping, but I really like sport and I like athletes and I like 
different types of athletes. And so, um, yeah, I'm coming from Portland, Maine. I came from a super diverse sporting background. I still race a little bit, but I have three um, school age kids who I sort of guide, you know, um, their trajectory in different sports. But yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of that it for me. Matt, you have anything to add at all in terms of in introduction or where people can find you or information on that way? Um, you know, not really in addition to what you said. Um, obviously, I've been, I've been competing as, a, as an athlete for, well, 32 years. I started competing when I was uh, 15 years old in 1988 and still am. Um, I'm 48 now, but I'm still, you know, actively competing in the Masters Division. And um, I've been a coach for almost as long as I've been, uh, been an athlete. I think I had my first paid coaching position when I was 19 and, um, uh, you know, and, and still coach to this day in a, in a wide range of demographics all the way from youth athletes through, you know, master's athletes in their 40s and 50s, you know, scholastically, private sector, uh, things like that, recreational athletes, as well as athletes that are trying to, you know, compete internationally and go overseas and represent Team USA, so kind of top to the bottom, you know, all those different types of things. And uh, I mean, the best place to find me is just, um, there's a, a weightlifting website called Catalyst Athletics. Um, all my articles are, are published through them, and I've had five books published uh, through Catalyst as well. So that's probably the best place to find me. And social media-wise, I'm on Facebook, but that's the only thing. Great. And Justin, we got a chance a little bit to say, say about you there. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add in terms of what you've got coming up or anything like that. No, I mean, I would just say the only thing, um, the only thing was that I've, I've been kind of dealing with all of this as what I should be doing as an athlete and also what I should be doing as a coach. So I'm kind of <clears throat> trying, I've been having to weigh out, you know, how much, how willing I am to go in on training and what, what that is going to look like. So I'm kind of dealing with, with things on both sides of the spectrum, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a real treat for everyone to get to hear what you guys have to say. Um, you know, I'm, I, I didn't put these topics that I want to cover in any particular order because I wanted to leave it really casual. But I think at this point, as we're hitting August in the year, you know, even when we hit August in a regular year, it's the mental freshness starts to weigh on athletes. And as coaches, we're managing, keeping people, you know, maybe they're getting mid-season breaks. We're keeping them motivated. We're looking towards if they're going to world championships at the end of the year or their second half of their season, those types of things. But you add the weight of a pandemic in it, and we had, you know, our normal off season. We had our winter training season, and then wacko hit in February, March. It's like, guess what? You're not going to get a season. And I think for a period of time, we had some hope that the later season races might happen. There was a little bit of hope, and so people, it was a little bit easier to manage at the start because we thought, oh well, we'll just hit the reset button. Some people took a break. Some people went into full off season mode and we're looking towards sort of this, you know, third or fourth quarter of the year of, you know, I'll, I'll be able to apply what strengths I'm gaining right now into this third and fourth quarter. And now we're seeing the reality of it looks like, Hey, 2021 is looking pretty grim in terms of, you know, what we're going to be able to do. So um, tell me how you're managing and what sort of, advice you're giving your coaches and athletes in terms and, and keeping them and and in particular you Justin as a as a professional athlete for for mental freshness and sort of what that means to you as coaches and and how you're helping people with that so I'll let you go ahead first Justin because you're managing okay. both sides there so I mean I think um I wouldn't say that I was a a pessimist early on but I kind of I felt like with the decisions that were being made, something like the NCAA tournament being canceled outright, school being closed, I was sort of like the, the ease of bringing racing back into all this seems really low on the important spectrum and like the willingness to shut down so many things means that we're probably looking at no racing for the year. Like we'll be lucky if we get to race. And I was thinking that way in March. So, um, so for me personally, I backed way off everything and basically was like, I'll start training the summer on a more sort of formal basis. For the people that I coach, I kind of had to weigh in there. I sort of felt like in the beginning of the pandemic, there was maybe like over enthusiasm, uh, like 
we're going to, we're going to push through this and come out strong and like everything, like the world's going to be great in June and we'll all be crushing races and stuff. And I was like, well, you know, guys, you know, maybe, <laughs> like maybe let's hedge it a little bit and kind of uh, rein it in. So uh, just with the nature of things, I think people started to buy in now that we're five, six months or whatever into this, I think it's a little bit different because now it's, it's been going on a while and there really isn't like a definitive end in sight. So a couple things that I would, a few things I would suggest is sort of when you're doing your training blocks, obviously, you know, don't make them as long or as big as they would be. And then insert these recovery blocks that are even easier than you would have been. And, and yeah, there's like the physical component, but I think that keeps you motivated is you, you really don't want to be really tired and you don't want an overuse injury because both of those things will lead you to like, you know, sort of micro depression um, and, and, you know, not really being able to deal with because everyone's already kind of dealing with a constant level of anxiety and uncertainty. And so if you take away their one outlet of, you know, I use exercise or training to be happy and that's not going to be good. And, um, the final thing I'll say is like my suggestion is to think about if there was never any racing ever again, how would you train? Do that like 90% of the time and do 10% of kind of like, this is for a purpose, you know, and for a pro athlete, maybe it's like 80, 20, but I think, I think right now it's really important to kind of like spend the majority of your time doing the things that make you happy as opposed to maybe make you, an optimized athlete. That's great advice for sure. Um, Matt, would you, what, in, in the strength world, you know, you, like you say, working with strength and conditioning and, um, you know, in particular Olympic lifting athletes and, and powerlifting athletes, and there are some meets available, even yourself, you know, looking around at different meets and traveling. How are you managing staying mentally fresh, but also helping athletes weigh up, you know, is now an appropriate time to compete and what does that meet look like mentally yeah um in, in weightlifting in, in the strength sports both you know olympic weightlifting and powerlifting i mean there there are events to compete in now i mean there are meets um there are no big ones you know the world championship the, the pan am championship all the, the, the national and everything those have all been canceled but but local meets local events are still are still on the calendar and there are, there are means to compete in, but one of the big things with athletes is, uh, with strength athletes is really kind of like trying to figure out the answer to, okay, yeah, there are means to lift in right now, but do I want to lift right now in a meet? I mean, cause we're, we're talking about, I mean, every, everybody knows about COVID and, and how it spreads and things like that. And, you know, weightlifting means and powerlifting means everybody knows what those are. I mean, those are like enclosed, low ventilation, hot, sweaty, droplets, sweating, everybody touching the same equipment type stuff. Um, they're, they're, they're almost like a checklist of how you can best spread this disease. <laughs> it's been like, uh, it's, it's, it's been, I know for, for my perspective, I mean, still, you know, still competing, not, not at a, you know, top national level, but, but definitely at a top uh, masters, you know, I, I guess age group or levels, you guys would say there are meets out there to compete in right now. But when I look at the calendar of where I want to compete, I'm like, okay, which States do I feel comfortable going to? Which ones do I don't feel comfortable going to? Um, I was scheduled to compete in a meet uh, here in Arizona uh, just next week. And, uh, and I've actually trained really well throughout this, this quarantine. I'm probably in, in stronger shape right now than I have been in, in two, three years. And I pulled out of this meet because I'm like, I'm not lifting in a meet in Arizona right now. You know, I just, I'm, I'm not one of those uh, hypochondriac, paranoid people when it comes to the disease, but I, I think it's stupid to act like this thing's a hoax or like it doesn't exist and like you can't get it and it could potentially, you know, make you really sick or kill you. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of in the, in the landscape with the rest of the athletes in the strength world of looking at the idea of getting together and meet right now and like, okay, there's stuff out there to do, but do I even want to do that, you know? Um, and in terms of training people for this, um, you know, throughout this, this whole, this whole time, it's, you know, kind of because Justin touched on this a second ago, I think when this whole thing blew up back in March and all these events started getting canceled and races and meets and things like that, I think we all kind of thought this was going to have blown over by now. 
Um, I think back in March, I think everybody thought we would probably be back in action by August. I think that was kind of like the general collective thinking in sports. Um, and here it is August. And I mean, in terms of like the numbers and things like that, I think we're in worse shape now than we were with COVID, uh, uh, you know, back in March. Um, and, uh, and another thing that's interesting about this is that, you know, the, the attitudes you're getting from athletes are kind of reflective of the attitudes that you're seeing just like, you know, I guess socially and politically uh, in this country in, in terms of the disease. I mean, some people, some athletes are treating this like this is a very, very serious disease that can kill you if you get it. And then some people are treating it like, like this thing's almost like a, a joke you don't have to worry about. So screw it, let's just go back to full action right now. You know, kind of the same as how things are boiling down politically in terms of like, I don't know, however you want to say, like right wing versus left wing thinking or whatever on, on, the, on the COVID thing. Um, but um, in terms of training, I mean, nobody that I coach has competed uh, since, you know, like January, February or some earlier than that. And nobody's probably going to compete the rest of this year. Um, so my, my philosophy as a coach on this whole thing has been pretty simple. It's I just, in terms of training my athletes, I just want to keep everybody within kind of like just, let's say, like reasonable striking distance of their top numbers and just try to keep them there as much as possible, you know, um, not peaking for anything, not trying any big personal records, but also not going into hibernation, you know, kind of keeping everybody at a good kind of like, let's say like upper moderate level uh, of training, kind of in, you know, kind of keeping everybody in a, in a physical state where like if a meet popped up in six weeks that they wanted to do, we could get ready in six weeks for like a, a, a top performance, um, you know, that kind of thing. But knowing that that uh i mean who knows when that's going to come it's been uh, it's been been a balancing act Kurt, what would you have to add to that in terms of you know the mental freshness side of things keeping your coaches mentally fresh as well um you know the athletes yes but also like i said you manage a group of coaches keeping them motivated and and directed in the right direction on how to help their athletes and um you know, mentally fresh as we get into August and then this, you know, third quarter of the year. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've said so many times to many people, like we coach human beings first and I, my, my other coaches are human beings. And, you know, the first sort of key word of any athlete is like individuality, right? Like you have to assess that individual. And like, as Matt said, some people are taking this as like, ah, oh, it's no big deal. Some people are like, you know, I mean, I, I have a few people who have not ridden their bicycles outside since March because of other fears. Um, as I told you in the email, I get some good intel. My wife is a PhD epidemiologist. Um, so I saw this coming, I knew it was coming. Uh, she's working on it full tilt right now here in, in the Northeast. Um, um, I'm calling for my athletes in the Northeast kind of like the longest December, you know, like initially it was like, oh, let's keep building some, some training. Let's keep gaining some fitness. And once your sort of chronic train load gets to a certain level, maybe some races will come back. And even my wife early on said, yeah, we might be racing by the end of summer. Again, going to what Matt talked about, maybe our higher level guidance nationally, that hasn't gonna happen. Um, but ultimately, like now, yeah, we're into a lot more of like, let's find some summer micro adventures. Let's find some human powered stuff. You know, as Justin pointed to, like a lot of what I call like flex days, right? Like you could go for a ride, but you could also go stand a paddle board or kayak or for big hikes with poles or, um, you know, what other summer activities that you don't necessarily do. but. And then for the coaches, the same thing is like engaging them to make sure that they're telling their people, right? Like it doesn't have to be balls to the wall right now. It does not, you know, I'm trying to think of like the last time I gave anyone such a hard session that I thought when I wrote it, like they may not complete this because I don't want an immune compromise. I don't, I know their stress bucket is very full. They don't complete a workout on a Wednesday in July and they're not going to race to actually use that fitness. Like why would I make it so hard? You know, so a lot of like, you know, it, instead of, structure intervals go run with some friends or go on a hard mountain bike ride i know you'll get some stochastic part lift type um intervals that way but yeah i mean exactly what what justin and matt said it's like i'm in the same sort of thinking like initially we thought hey this is a chance we'll do some fun challenges um you know there's all these zoom meetups right everyone was zooming i was like there's going to be zoom burnout by by the early summer no one's going to want to go on zoom um here i and, have but, you on zoom i know, I know but come on. <laughs> In like since April, so I, I was ready for I was my my uh, my burnout has, has ended. But I mean, right. are we doing this again into early winter? You know, I mean, are we going to be having trainer workouts on Zwift? You know, I live in Portland, Maine. Like, 
I'll ride outside until December, but you know, at some point a lot of many people won't. And it's like, oh, let's meet up on Friday. So I'm hoping that, that we see a trend, whether it's a vaccine, whether it's uh, herd immunity, whatever things we want to talk about. But yeah, I mean, again, it's keeping the, keeping the stress levels at this moderate level. And exactly what Matt said, like maybe with endurance athletes, it's like an eight to 10 week window. Like if your CTL is high, your body composition is close, you're like, you, you know, like you've been doing a little bit of this and that, like maybe not swimming as much as you can because pools aren't open. But if they flip the switch and said, we can race on, um, so it's August 1st, like, you know, September 15th or October 1st, 90% of my people are 90% there. You know, they're just like, okay, like, you know, no, no more like two or three beers on Friday night. Now it's one on Friday and no more. And then it's, you know, it's, it's, it's more rate, you know, that it's just a dial, right? Race specificity is like a dial. We're in that sort of you general physical prep to get us like 90% of the way there and then turn that dial and go on to get ready to race. But. I don't, I don't foresee that happening anytime really soon. So. No, that's what all about you? Stuff. Sorry, good. No, I was going to say, what about you, Marilyn? Yeah, I think, um, you know, say, really, we're all saying, saying really similar things. And the big thing is treating everybody as an individual, like you said, Kurt. Like, you know, I have people who have backed things way off down to a point of, just like Matt said, you know, they're very afraid of, you know, what might happen to them if, if they catch this. So we treat that with great respect and, and bring things right down. That's where they're comfortable. And then I have other athletes that are really, you know, feeling like if they don't have something that they're chasing after that feels like they're accomplishing something within every cycle, then that really brings them down. And mentally and emotionally, they just get too distracted or too beat down. So we keep putting actual goals in front of them in four weeks and six week blocks that are that are almost they're right there you know they're not that far away because if i say to them well the three next three months is going to be kind of loosey-goosey and you can kind of do whatever you want we'll just see where this goes they would drift far so far away that and get sort of almost in that depressed mode that that wouldn't be a good direction for them so everything from you know you know within my group where it is really relaxed and now's not the time to be you know, giving them too much structure or too much, you know, too much reins and, and letting them take as much rest as they need or as much freedom as they need, right to like, hey, we're going to do a really structured four week block and try and hit a PR on this test set because they need those markers and those indications that they're, they're getting better and that this training isn't just sort of like a monotonous day in and day out. And without the racing, they need that, you know, that mental reassurance. And um, so I think it's, you know, individualizing that has been really listening to your athletes and asking them, most importantly, asking each one of them what they need um, more than deciding what each, what this is my program and this is what we're going to do. I've asked each athlete, what do you need through this time and customize that to them. And then the other mistake I saw a lot of coaches make is at the beginning, they, they threw everything out there. Like you said, they got thrown went nuts with challenges and meetings and all of this stuff. And I said, Let's, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do everything at all at once. Let's trickle this in in case this goes on for a long time. So in the beginning, when everyone was doing a million Zwift rides to keep everybody engaged, I said, I'm not going to do that to start with. Let's just, you know, handle things as they come right now. And now when I hit the third quarter and I felt this like sigh of depression, like, oh God, we thought races were going to come back and now they're not. That's when I brought in, okay, let's meet for a group ride once a week and see improvements once a week. And then we'll do a test at the end of it because now is the time to bring that in. And same thing. It's like, if you, it's kind of like the, you don't, you don't go on your first date and throw it all out there. Right. Like when this happened at the beginning, it's like, let's, let's just trickle things in and see how this is going to play out. And then as it goes on, you should still have some some things in your basket as a coach that you can bring in to keep keep athletes engaged and and what each athlete needs independently so that's that's been my biggest thing um matt and i had a great conversation the other night and i'd like to hear you guys' opinions about this is you know racing takes as we go through this year all this stuff is you know it's good that we're managing them and keeping them 90 percent and we're keeping them you know you know keeping ourselves and keeping the athletes somewhat engaged however competition takes practice and it's our jobs as coaches to prepare people to compete. That's why for a lot of people, some people aren't doing this to compete and that's fine. You'll recognize which athletes those are, but for a large portion of our athletes, they do this to compete and competition takes practice. And as we know, we even do in, in season, we do, um, you know, 
preparation races, we call them hardening races, C races, however you want to phrase it. But you know, those first races of the year, we know dusting out the cobwebs, hey, we're testing out the training that we did all winter, where are we at, checkpoints, that kind of thing. Um, you know, before you go into your major competitions. How, how are we as coaches going to make sure that after 12 months, possibly, and possibly longer, of no racing, that now fortunately everybody's going to be in the same boat right i mean no matter what competition you're doing everybody's going to be in the same boat however if we're going to be a program that's going to excel above everybody else because that's our goal as coaches is we're all we're all competitive we want our athletes to kick kick, kick ass and and beat i want my athletes to be your athletes you know that's the kind of how we are as coach as athletes and coaches so if we're if i'm looking at mine i say i want mine to come out the best of this and the strongest how are we going to mentally have them prepared to compete because competing hurts and we don't ever go there in training, especially where if we're saying we're encouraging them to not do that in training right now. So physically, mentally, skills wise, um, all of the things that we get in competition that we don't get in training, you know, tactics, um, that mental competitive edge, that willingness to press against, you know, pain that we might not get in, in training. How do we make sure that when it is go time that, the time period hasn't been so long since athletes have done that, that they're, you know, we're not setting, they're not going to be successful. Like how do we make sure that they are successful? They stay in tune, they stay in touch, that kind of thing. What are some, you know, it's, I'm not sure anyone's really thought of that much through this period because we're so concerned about holding everybody back. Um, and I want to, you know, I'll touch on the other extreme of that of some things that I've seen uh, you know, that we do need to hold certain situations back, but on the performance side of things, if we're looking at, yeah, when we come out of this, we do still want to be competitors. That's a skill in itself. It's a physical, mental, and even just skill wise, you know, people get better as they compete more. You know, Matt and I talked about this, you know, the online weightlifting competitions are great right now. However, it's very different standing in your own garage in front of a phone, getting your best lift recorded and then submitting that or doing, you know, um, than it is doing a Zwift road race versus being like on the road, 50 miles an hour, rocks, pip, you know, bumping shoulders with people, cornering, gravel, all that kind of stuff. Um, standing on a platform, you've got 300 eyes looking at you, a judge standing in front of you, staring at you. Justin, I mean, you know, it's different when you've got, you know, some dude pressing the pace and you're like, oh man, this isn't my decision right now. And you've got to respond and react. And that takes, it takes practice. It's taken you you know, what, 10 years of developing that, that skill to be a competitor and be, you know, be competitive. So how do we make sure that, that that doesn't get too far away? So Justin, I'll let you lead this again, just because you're in that position right now, deciding like, Hey, I got to still be able to be ready to take a hit from the strongest men in the world and stand there and say, I'm ready to compete for top three. How are you making sure that, that, that you're ready for that and that you don't get too far away from that? Uh, I don't know that I am ready for that. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. I think it would really like, um, I mean, I've, I have been training and some days I'm moving quicker than others, but I have been holding back on like, I'm going to do a workout uh, with the exception maybe of in the pool, like the pool is sort of conducive to a little more structure, but most of the, most of the riding and the running that I do, the terrain dictates a bit of sort of ad hoc intensity. So, I mean, generally I would say the best thing to do is just to start really small. I mean, it, it could be like, um, you know, something that takes 15 to 20 minutes where you truly give a flat out effort so that when you're 10 minutes into it, you're definitely don't want to do it anymore, but you only have five minutes left or 20 minutes left, you know, um, uh, I do coach one athlete that has like some uh, where he's at in the country. There are some small local races, you know, and this will be the first time he's been able to race. And I just, there is sprint and Olympic and I'm like, just do the sprint because you're going to want to quit no matter which distance you do. So you might as well like only have 20 minutes left um, because yeah, it's, it, it's different and there's no way to simulate that. And I don't think that you should necessarily well, I, I wouldn't necessarily try to do that. I, I do think that you, there's situations you can do where um, you, you design sessions that can simulate certain demands of the race and make people uncomfortable. But um, 
you know, in an ideal world, when competitions do come back, you can start with something short and quick and maybe low key local, and then work your way back into a more structured and competitive environment. For Iron Man stuff, I mean, you don't need quite as bit of sharpness, and you can simulate a lot more of the intensity. So maybe, maybe that could be done cold. And even if you don't think that you're doing very well, you might actually be doing just fine um, because it, it's more of sort of a steady state intensity versus like flat out. But yeah, for the flat out stuff or or close to that, you know, highly competitive half Ironman sort of competitors, um, it's gonna take it's gonna take a readjustment period, and they're just you're gonna need to 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 learn to hurt again um but i i would be hesitant to do too much to try to maintain that right now because you just like if you start doing it now and all of a sudden there's not racing for nine months i mean you know it's it's not really worth it so um maybe some small things could be some strava segments that you find exciting um i i wouldn't suggest doing it within all your training but you know maybe after your recovery block and you rest it up, pick some segment that you want to either go for a PR or a KOM, depending on your ability, yeah. uh, and use that. That kind of puts you on the clock, and then yeah, practicing nerves too, right? Yeah, people, yeah. If we get, if it's been a really long time since you've competed, and then you remember, like, oh man, I'm it's hard to sleep. I'm a bit nervous. Like I've got you know yeah. like morning jitters. I've got like competition jitters. That kind of stuff. Especially for us who have athletes that that struggle with that, you know, like. Matt, how many, we I talked about this, you know, I've been competing since I've been nine years old on some kind of stage and the first weightlifting meet, I walked out there, I've been, you know, snatching 40 kilos with my eyes closed. And then I walk out on the platform in front of anyone, everyone, it's like, I'm a giraffe standing on pogo sticks, you know, shaking legs. And all of a sudden you forget what the heck you're doing. Cause, cause the nerves get the best of you, even though you're an experienced competitor. So how do, you know, we need to, how do we keep those skills of, of little things, like you say, not pressing so hard, Justin, that you're, you're making the athletes tired or you're using up something that, Hey, maybe we don't need to go that hard right now. However, like the finer tuned skills of like, how do we deal with nerves and, um, you know, just those kinds of things, Matt, I'll let you touch on that a little bit. Yeah. I think, um, kind of touching on something that Kurt was saying a minute ago, like the, if, if we're kind of going with the idea that like the general training approach, with athletes during this whole thing is to keep everybody kind of in that like like 90 85 to 90 percent range most of the time you know that type of thing so they're always like kind of reasonable striking distance from the top stuff um i think that's a good way to do this i mean first of all i think that if you're if you're a competitive athlete if you're a serious competitive athlete you probably shouldn't ever be you know, anywhere below 85 to 90 percent of your your top stuff. I think you should pretty much be able to do that, no matter you know, two weeks after a big race, you know, two in the morning, drunk, whatever. You should be able to 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 hit 85, 90 percent right around there. Um, if if you're if you're training the right way, if you're kind of really looking to 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 do something big competitively as a as an athlete. But as far as competing again. Um, you know, putting everybody back into competition after this whole thing is over. Um, I'm going to handle that very much on a, a athlete to athlete individual type basis. Um, I coach some people that uh, they're they're pretty much. Uh, I, I I think I could probably you know uh, you know send them to a different planet for six years and bring them back and stick them in a meet and they go out there and whoop some ass and and make all their lifts and and do great right away. And then I coach some others that like. It's going to be, uh, it, 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 there's going to have to be an easing in process, like Justin said. Um, I think the way I'm going to handle it is uh, people who I think are going to be suffering from an excessive level of nerves when they come back, uh, when they start competing again, I'm going to make sure that the weights we put on the bar are weights that I know they're going to make, um, you know, to, to make sure that the, the confidence kind of starts rolling again. And I think it's probably best that, you know, for competition purposes, that those happen at smaller events. Um, I, I wouldn't make my first meet back after this thing, the world championship, um, unless I was somebody who, you know, has been competing for 25 years and 
they could probably jump back in the world championship the first meet back and, and go out there and have a lot of success because they're just that, that's that's what they've got inside you know so but i mean you're right competing is uh, learning how to compete is a skill unto itself you know learning learning a sport learning how to be a good athlete in your sport is one thing but learning how to be a good competitor is something completely different and um I mean, the, but the thing is, like, at the end of the day, like, after all this talk and all this planning and all this thought and all this, you know, work and program and everything like that, at the end of the day, you just got to stick it back out there, you know, just just throw them back out there and see what they can do. Yeah. What would what would you add to that, Kurt? Yeah, I mean, it was brought up a few times. I mean, um, you know, that optimal state of arousal, that bell curve, right? You know, you have to be on, you have to be near the peak um, to really perform well, whether it's, you know, a PR snatch or recent 70.3 right you can't if you're yawning on the starting line you're probably on the front side and if you you're puking in a bucket as you're walking onto the to the platform or on the front line you're probably on the the far side um and i'm super scared that that's going to be that's going to become dulled by a lot of people um there's a concept too we do this sometimes all these workouts before long course races their short workouts are like to reset the central governor you know if you believe in that concept that the brain ultimately where if you're going so much harder than what the race is, when you get to the 7.3, you're like, oh, this isn't that hard. You do a few sessions that are just like, you know, like, you know, balls to wall type sessions. I'm not programming those. I don't plan to program those. Um, I will say this thinking more like sociologically, I think the first race is back during the small races. I mean, I don't think like most of my people, you said right now, main 70.3 is happening in three weeks. Most of my folks are, are too skittish to come to it, you know? So I was talking to a bunch of people about like how this could be a reckoning, especially for the sport of triathlon where WTC kind of took over. Some yeah. of these smaller events could come back. And people, you know, they're like, here's the social distancing rule. TP starts, you know, corral this, blah, 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 blah. I would love to see, I mean, I've been doing these sports since like 1989. Where are all these races that I used to do? They, this is a chance for them to come back in a smaller, yeah. lower key approach because, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be – in Madison or in, in Kona with a bunch of people, you know, breathing all over me and, and running around three quarters naked. So I, I'm thinking like, you know, we're going to see smaller races come back first. And I also think those would be the races that people will be okay if they go there and kind of, you know, poop the bed for lack of a better term. They'll just say, ah, you know, was, I had to break this seal. I had to get back into the race with them. Uh, I had to go through that. I had to find that optimal state of arousal, you know, like, where's my race bag? Where's my race gear? You know, like, so yeah, I'm, I'm super scared that that's going to be the one thing that's truly dulled right now. I mean, I, I, some of my athletes, I worry about their swimming because there's like, in Maine, it's nearly impossible to swim in the pool right now. There's only like a couple pools open. Um, but I mean, it's still like they can bike and run a lot. It's, I'm not worried about their physical prep. I am worried about that psychological preparedness to go deep in the well when, you know, they're in the arena. And um, I guess I'll just cross that bridge like Justin and, and, and honestly like Matt as well. Like when, when that time comes, right? Like we're first and foremost, first world problems, right? Like we'll be like, sweet, we're back racing. There's, you know, there's a vaccine or we've got a better track on this or we're hurt. Like I said, whatever. Um, I'll go, I'll circle back to all my people and be like, okay, do you remember how to race? You know, like we actually have a duathlon here next Saturday. It's like a TT. I guess it would actually be called a biathlon. It's just a bike and a run. Yeah. TT start on the bike, fastest to slowest. Um, and I have two or three people racing it and I'm like, do you remember how this feels? You know, do you remember what that, I mean, that, that's a hard effort, 13 mile bike, 5k run. I mean, that's full tilt for mm -hmm. about an hour. Right. You know, so it's like, um, I'm sure there'll be some people come back and go, Whoa, that was quite painful. You know, and then you'll get as a coach, right. You're going to get there. like, I don't know if I was in shape for it. I'm like, well, you were in shape for it <laughs> or pretty close, but we didn't know it was actually going to happen. And so we just jumped into it reactively. And it's not like you're under the bar and you have to worry about some catastrophic injury or whatever. Like it's more of like, yeah, you, you suffered more so than you thought you might suffer. So. And I think that's just, I mean, I think it's just important to address this topic as athletes and coaches is saying like, Hey, you know, step one is recognize if you haven't raced for a really long time, you just need to be ready to like, I think we've universally agreed on is that there's going to be some, preparation races going in, you know, whether it's a Strava or a small event or, you know, chipping away, that kind of thing. Because I think newer coaches might just forget that altogether. They might, you know, or newer athletes, I might just think, oh, well, I, you know, I haven't raced in a year, so I should be fresh and fired up and ready to go and be expecting like a lifetime and working for a year. I'm going to see my best lifetime PR. And then when maybe they get out there and go, holy Toledo, I've, you know, been uh, removed from this for a while and it catches them off guard. So I think just preparing them 
to be ready for that and, and recognizing that and setting these stages up, which just naturally, because of all of our experience, we already know that, okay, we set up test sets, smaller races, those kinds of things. So already, you know, but for a newer coach or a newer athlete, they might not be even thinking that way. So just, you know, hopefully they get a chance to hear this and help them think the right way as they come out of this. So, and then on the other end of the spectrum, what I'm seeing from even just the, my own, um, communities and, and groups that I'm involved in when I'm out there as an athlete myself and, and with some of my athletes is you get the other extreme of athletes that they haven't raced all year. So they're treating some of their training as, I mean, they're going just like cagey, crazy, over the top, going so hard that I'll look around and go, this isn't safe, you know, because they haven't been able to go out and and like blast their, you know, blast their feathers or whatever it is that they're looking to do in a race. And they haven't done that in so long that they get out into their training environments and they're where they would normally be a little bit more sensible on a day-to-day -day basis because they know they're gearing up for a big event. They're taking risks, um, you know, maybe on, on descents or in groups or um, in certain sessions that they normally wouldn't just because that energy would have been expended at a race or something like that. And then the other side of that is also not taking any rest breaks. Justin, you and I talked about this when I was visiting is that, you know, racing provides this natural, um, you know, rhythm through the year where we, we rest into a race, we race, we rest out of a race, then we go into a new, you know, training block. We assess where are we at, where, how did we do, what do we need to work on? And so we have this, you know, long extended period of time with, without that natural rhythm. So we've already sort of touched on that a little bit about building that in. However, you know, the, the people that are going out there and like every Saturday is now the world championship. So, you know, how are you reining that in a little bit without, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, kill someone's spirit in a time when it's already hard. You know, if they, if someone's got a lot of mojo and they've got a lot of spirit and they've got a lot of gusto, you kind of want to be like, all right, you know, this, you know, I had some athletes where they were racing Zwift like four days a week. Cause they were just going, they were just like, I got to do something and I'm not going to race. And, and I, you know, in, in cert, with certain athletes, I went, you know what, that's okay right now. And we actually like came up with strategies, like, how are we going to win this race? And we, I got excited about it. And then we debriefed it and we said, okay, well, how are you going to win, you know, day three on the stage race? And I went through like post, you know, stage race fueling and like everything you do. And we made it exciting. And I went, okay, I mean, we wouldn't race four days a week normally, but let's get after this. And other athletes, I'll look around and go like, hey, this is too much and you're literally putting yourself at risk and I think this is a really bad idea. And then the last piece of that that I'll just add to that is coaches that I actually see designing these, you know, uh, random challenges that go on for a month long that have no progression or account for load on top of load of one another. And my fear when I see some of this is, you know, they're, they're thinking, well, now's the time to do like a million CrossFit movements in with my triathlon movements, in with my stand-up paddleboard, in with my mountain biking, in with my race efforts, in with my 2000 squats that I'm going to do, in with my marathon that I'm going to try to fill in and do my longest lifetime ride. And there's just, you know, so the other extreme of the caution that we're talking about, I'm seeing all the way from coaches to athletes where they're taking it the other way. How do we allow people that energy and not deaden them in, in terms of taking away, you know, the only excitement that they have in their life right now, but protect them so that they don't hurt themselves. And like, like you say, Justin, acquire an injury that like, you know, you're not going to come back from this. You just blew out your knee doing something that you're, you know, you shouldn't be doing. You're, you know, 62 years old and you're trying to do squat snatches into a marathon or something like that, you know, something crazy that you're seeing people do. So Tell me a little bit, Kurt, I'll start with you on that because I know you have like a broad range of athletes and experience and stuff. And so you're probably seeing a lot of that with, with coaches and stuff. So tell me a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I mean, we did a few of the challenges early on, but they were very low. Like we'd have people do like two Turkish get-ups a day for 30 days, you know, and like these, most of these were like, you know, this goes back to like, you know, if you, if you know a move like Turkish get-up, it's kind of sort of like loaded yoga, you know, and it's like, as long as you know how to do the move, most of my people doing it without any weight because they didn't have a home gym. So they were just kind of doing it as like a part of their daily mobility session. Um, 
you know, like longest day, we said, hey, find something really cool on June 21st or 22nd, you know, but, um, but there's also was guided towards people who had this like already high level of training, right? Like they've been doing some four or five hour rides, so they went and did a seven hour ride. It wasn't like, you know, I didn't take them off the couch. That's the thing. Like I saw that early on when people were like, oh, well, if you train really hard, you'll be immune compromised and you can get COVID-19. Not if you've been training hard for 20 years. You know, I'm not no more immune compromised on March 13th of 2020 than I was on March 13th of 2019 or whatever. So, you know, it's like you saw that I was going around and stuff. And I was like, listen, like, yeah, if, if you were a complete couch potato and you started trying to run a marathon that day, yes, you would be immune compromised. Regardless, you could get the seasonal flu, you could get anything at that point. So, um, so when we did some of that stuff, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times that's like either a trike group or like a coach's group and they're trying to sort of like, I call it like kind of seated, like flavor of the day type of coaching. Like I'm going to go ride 140 miles on June 22nd. So all of my people around me should come do that. Even though this person here has never ridden more than 35 miles, you know? So it's like, don't really do that. Like I did a eight hour ride on June 22nd. Every single person there was at least as strong as I am and probably stronger. And we finished, you know, there was no like, there was no like 40 minute regroups at the top of times. I mean, we, we, we were a group of guys that could handle running for 140 something miles where we did. So, um, you know, be like, I think back to your old, like the old, uh, epic camps you guys would do like in Colorado, right? Like you didn't just turn up for those. You, know, you weren't just like, Hey, I'm going to go do the camp with, with Gordo in Colorado. It was like, you better have trained really hard before you got there. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we were careful with that and we still are really careful and we're, you know, like I said, like the, the, the fourth key word that I always use when I got athletes is sustainability. You know, like people are like, oh, are you freaking out? I'm using myself here as an example. Like, are you, or are you, I have to use Matt, I probably use Justin, I use you, Maryland. Like you won't be able to race in 2020. I'd be like, okay, what about 89, 90, 91? 90, you know I mean? Like there, there were years, like I had twins in 2008. I didn't really race much in 2008, you know, like, so it's like, I don't, for me, I, I'm constantly reminding my people of that. Like, you know, you do some fun stuff and do some crazy stuff and do some stuff outside of your norm. Like, um, but as Justin has mentioned many times, like do nothing that will hurt you. Like the Everesting was a huge thing. Right. And I coach a very good female pro mountain biker, like really, really good. The last word I said to her on the phone before is if you feel any niggles or naggles, you need to stop. Well, she ended up getting tendonitis in her knee. Luckily it was only like a five or six days off the bike, but it was definitely one of those things where you're like, the Everest thing was cool and she completed it and like she's in like on the website whatever it's called but if she got hurt doing that I would have been super bummed you know and thankfully she was in and she's back training full tilt and stuff but yeah so we're you know getting the individuality side is like can the person handle doing something like that you know um like I I know a fair bit about like strength training if you said you know do do you know do snatch squats I, I could do them but I wouldn't necessarily just give them to some some guy a coach who doesn't even know what a snatch squat is you know so um, yeah, it's, it's, again, it's, it's, it kind of still goes back to, I think you and I talked to well, on that ride last year, Marilyn was like, ultimately our job is a service job. Like we're communicators and we service people. We, we, and, and so I just would talk to someone. I'd be like, you know, they say, Oh, I saw so-and-so is going to, you know, he's going to run an ultra marathon on, on Wednesday and be like, but you're managing Achilles tendonitis and maybe a bum hip. Does that sound like a good idea? You know, and, and that you nine, nine times out of 10, they'll say, I think you're right. You know, sometimes. You know, I also say often that I coach adults and sometimes you just have to be like, okay, well, my guidance is to do this. You're free to do whatever you'd like to do. You know, so. My favorite line is I suggest. Yeah. <laughs> my suggestion is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Justin, what do you think? I mean, you know, you've been doing a lot of, um, you know, off, off road, off beaten path type rides and, yeah. um, you know, which are really cool. And obviously someone of your ability, no problem, right? Like you can jump on your road bike, you can descend down sawmill in the, in the deep gravel and rocks and it's pretty steep and, and you're going to handle your bike and you're going to be just fine. However, some um, amateurs may be following you on Strava and they decide I'm going to jump on, I'm going to do the ride that Justin did because it's cool and, uh, you know, I'm, and it, I want to because it's COVID. And then they realize, holy crap, I'm sliding down the gravel and hit a rock and break their collarbone. So how is, how do you, you talked about the side of being a professional athlete and then balancing it being a coach, you know, you know what you need to do to keep yourself mentally fresh and strong. And after, you know, so many years of training hard, um, keep it fun, keep it light and keep the work high without it being too structured. You know that those rides are, are what's going to do that for you. However, if you have X so-and-so say, Hey, I want to go do that. 
you know, and you find out they did it later and they broke their collarbone. Like, how do you, how do you manage that as a coach athlete sort of balancing act? Yeah. Uh, so like for myself, I'm not really into the super big challenges right now. Um, you know, my, my type of challenge would be sort of like, like on Wednesdays when I ride are usually my highest vert days. And I try to have like, I try to challenge myself with the amount of time that it takes me to get the vert versus like, I'm going to do 50,000 vert or something. It would be like, what's the fastest way I could get to 10 K, you know, could I do it in four hours or something like that? Um, so that, that's kind of like where I draw the line. Cause I don't really, I don't like being really tired. I never have. It's always like needed to serve a purpose. <laughs> I feel like if I'm this tired, it's because, you know, I'm trying to do well in a race or something. So, but like on a day to day basis, you know, there's, there's a lot of training I can do that makes me feel really good and keeps me fit, but it's not that final tick me over the top type of stuff. So that's for me, for, um, for some people that I've coached, um, you know, two, two people have Zwifted Everest, done Everesting on Zwift. Um, and, uh, both of them had time goals as well, but they're both highly experienced and, we talked about it far enough out that we trained for it. I mean, they, you know, they did, you know, 50, like a, um, uh, more or less like half of it in training in order to kind of like figure out the pacing, figure out the fueling, how are we going to do that? And then also when it was done, we respected the, like, I was like, there's no reason to rush back into things. You know, we don't need to like float this into a training block or something, you know, like we can just, you know, take several days off and, you know, sort of wait until you feel like you're in a good mood when you're in a good mood, it's probably time to move back on. So, um, so I'm, I'm generally like, especially with, uh, cycling and for most people, it's not going to be swimming because they don't really have the, but those two mediums, I'm usually pretty open to kind of things on the extreme end. It's the running that I shut people down. Like, I'm just like, you know, um, uh, I had one athlete kind of want to do a, a run challenge thing. And I basically said, uh, no, but I was like, but I said, but, but we can do it, but it would need to be like, it's basically the last thing you're doing for the year. So I'm like, it's kind of like, then you would be taking sort of like your normal off season to be like the last race of the season. So right. he can decide if, if that's something that he wants to do. So I'm definitely, I don't really, I like to hear people out and what it is that they want to do. Mm -hmm. and um especially if that gives us something to work with for five weeks like hey there's this thing i want to do let's get ready for it and you know that way you can not only do it but maybe excel at it and have fun with it because you're doing well um and that's gonna that's just different for everybody i mean not everybody is 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 wanting to zwift on everest or everest on zwift i certainly wouldn't yeah. i haven't even ridden i haven't ridden my trainer once so during all this, um, so like, I'm, I'm not into the virtual stuff as much, yeah. uh, unless it's like serving a purpose. I don't really enjoy it. So, uh, so yeah, I think you just got to look at everybody's own situation and sort of decide what it is they're capable of. Yes. It can be a little bit of a reach prepare for it. And when it's over, respect the recovery after it, move on to the next thing. Yeah. I think that's the, the, the big thing that, I like what you said there is that the recovery part afterwards, because uh, another thing that I'm seeing is people, because we don't, like I talked about, we don't have that normal rhythm of pro do a preparation block, taper, race, recover. There's this um, blur of, you know, training for a long time. And we know as coaches, yeah, we always want to be within striking range, but there's also a risk of just sort of, you know, training, tra the whole purpose of training is to add stress and then recover and you know then you adapt and you see a, a boost in your performance and so you're always adding stress recovering boosting performance and so if there's just this like steady line for too long then we start to see people drop off right like you can only do volume for so long before it doesn't it doesn't work anymore you can only do intensity so long before it doesn't work anymore so these natural rhythms of you know, we need to train, change up the training blocks. We need to change the training stimuli, the different responses, the recovery, you know, the, the maybe the mid-season breaks, those kinds of things. I think just acknowledging that for each athlete and watching, watching as coaches, not just hearing what they have to say in terms of, 
okay, this is what I need mentally and emotionally in terms of challenges and different things we put out there. But watching is if they're doing something for too long, are they still responding to the training? Because our whole point of training is to see, you know, a stress, a response, recover, improve. So how many, how long do we go before we're not seeing that in a particular athlete anymore, making sure we're watching that. And this leads me to, I didn't leave you out on this. I'm leaving you out a little on this one, Matt, but I'm going to let you start with this next one. And, and our final one, because I don't want to keep people too long here. The final thing I want to touch on is, you know, how do we, um, you know, make sure that, um, you know, our coaches, like you've been coaching a lot of different sports, whether it was track and field or football or weightlifting, make sure that our coaches know what to watch for and how to direct them. So if we're looking at this, maybe possibly 12 months, maybe possibly longer, if you had a group of new coaches, which you do, you, you teach the programs for USA weightlifting, what do we say to the, the younger coaches, the new coaches and the athletes? Um, what would be like your biggest piece of advice of managing this whole time? Because we've, we've sort of touched on both extreme ends and everything in the middle of what we believe and what we're doing. Like if you had to take a brand new, I've only been coaching for two years and I've got a program of 50 age groupers because we see a lot of that, right? We see people, they haven't been doing the sport that long. They haven't even done that much of, of the sport themselves that long. And now they're in this pandemic and they're trying to manage a group of 50 athletes what advice as experienced coaches would you give them like the, the very for, sort of icing on the cake that you would give them to manage through this time? Um, well, uh, first to, to say something about the last thing we were talking about, because I didn't get the answer about that. So I just want to say something about that. Um, the, the whole thing about going too hard during this time, um, that, that was dear and dear to me because I've been doing that myself as a lifter. Um, like, you know, right about three hours before we started this call, I went out and did a heavy squat workout out in the garage. And, you know, I, I probably would have, like, I probably could have got shot with a rifle right before the workout, and I would have produced about the same result as what I did today. And then afterwards, I went to put in put in my numbers on my little training file that I do. And then I realized that, like, this is week 23 of, like, the current program that I'm on. And I went back and looked, I'm like, how many easy weeks have I given myself out of these 23 weeks? I think two. Um, so I'm not injured, but I'm starting to get, I'm, I'm starting to get forced my knees in terms of needing to, to back down and change things up and freshen up a little bit. So I get that. Um, you know, in weightlifting, it's, it's going to be a little bit different in strength sports because you're not going to have athletes come to you very often with like crazy training ideas that you think might be a bad idea. You know, in endurance sports, you don't find a 140-mile bike ride and, and come up and say, hey, coach, can I do this? When you know damn well they don't have 140-mile, you know, bike fitness. Um, in weightlifting, it's different. You know, you get an athlete who snatches, they've got a personal record in the snatch of 205 pounds, let's just say. They're not going to come to you one week and say, hey, coach, can I go up to 280 this week? <laughs> they're, they're, they're not good because if, if they do, then it's, then it's an easy out for you as a coach because you can point at that and say, like, okay, just the fact that you asked that means you're too stupid to do this. So let's let's the let's, bar doesn't lie. The bar doesn't lie. Let, let's call it a day here. You know, um, we can apply that weight, to endurance sports too. Right? <laughs> weight, weightlifting is so unbelievably measurable, and your your limits are so clear and defined, and so like concrete in terms of like if you try and push it too hard, you're looking at guaranteed failure or injury. It's a little bit different from endurance sport in that in that perspective. But getting back to what you asked about, um, how do we uh, you know work with coaches during this time? Um, I, I mean, I guess the main thing I would do is kind of advise them to follow a lot of the guidelines that we've been talking about during the Zoom call. You know, keep your athletes in a good, high, moderate range, and just keep them there. And when they need to be back down, when their numbers and their results indicate that they need an easy week, then go ahead and give them an easy week, that kind of thing. Um, another thing too, I think you and Kurt were just mentioning this a second ago, working with, ad with, with adults and you know, using the approach of like, well, I would suggest when it comes to training advice and, uh, you know, and then letting them be adults and make their own decisions about what they wanna do, um, I, uh, I, I don't have athletes um, uh, propose different things to me very often, like different things from what I've told them to do. Usually, 
the people I work with are good. Like I give them a job to do. It's like, yes, sir. No, sir. They get it done. And that's it. If somebody ever differs from, from, if somebody wants to do something different from what I think they should do, I have kind of like a stock speech as a coach with that. I say like, okay, this is what I think you should do. If you want to do this different thing, I mean, it's a free country and you're a grown adult, you can, but let's just have an understanding right up front. If this goes bad, it's on you, right? If this, if this goes bad and if you get hurt, it's your fault. It's not my fault. You don't get to blame me for it. Um, that kind of thing. And, and that, that's usually, you know, usually it's a good, good conversation to have, I guess, if you have people that, that don't want to do what you're telling them to do. But I think if you work with people who very often don't want to do what you tell them to do, then that's, that's kind of, a, there's a bigger problem there that needs to get flushed. Um, but as far as like working with other coaches, I would say just try to keep them from losing their minds with this, you know, um, like you, you talked a little bit earlier, Marilyn, about, you know, younger coaches coming up with all these crazy challenges and all these wacko ideas that are like getting their people hurt and whatnot. I mean, that I, as, as a coach myself, I don't really care if, if they do that. I mean, another coach, you know, doing stupid shit and blowing up their athletes, that doesn't bother me. You know, it's, it's, that, that's, that's their problem. It's not going to set back what I'm doing. It makes my job easier, I guess, you know, in terms of, you know, when we finally compete. But um, I think like keeping this whole thing in just kind of like a hovering mode um, throughout this time. And, uh, and, and I guess the last thing I would say without talking too long about this is, you know, people, when, when we talk about being an athlete, whether it's a triathlete or, a, you know, weightlifter or powerlifter or whatever, there's always this kind of conversation about how these sports are a combination of both physical and mental, you know, being a, being a triathlete, 50% physical, 50% mental. You know, if one way that I think we can look at this is that this COVID situation is, in, in a way, it's almost like the biggest mental test of everybody's, uh, you know, emotional and psychological ability that we could come up with. Um, the people who are the most resilient and the most disciplined and the smartest um, throughout this time are the ones who are going to have the most success when we come back from this. Um, and I guess the trick is just to make sure that you as an athlete or a coach are on the high end of that once this whole thing's over. Um, because, uh, because this is going to end eventually. I mean, who knows when it's going to be, but it is going to end. And, um, you know, the, at, at that point, I think, the numbers and the race results and the meet results are going to indicate the people who were like, just kind of like toughest up here uh, throughout this time. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Kurt or Justin? Yeah. I mean, I have a few things. Uh, I think I said it to my athletes last week, I said like at some point, 2021 is going to ask what you did in 2020. You know, it's like this builds, right? There's no like switch off, switch on. I'm race fit. Um, if I was trying to, I mean, this is a great opportunity for a newer coach, right? Like, it's easy when there's racing. Swim, bike, run, transition, some gear, mental side, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, I presented at Level 1 clinics for many, many years. Um, this is a great time to educate yourself on more, right? Like, for me, I'm the worst. I, I mean, like I said, like, here's my whole of knowledge, and it's very deep. Like, read a book from Matt. Read a book from Jack Daniels. Read a book from Eddie B in cycling. Read a, you know, and, like, because ultimately, like, the good coaches, the coaches that are really technically knowledgeable and have good bedside manner will survive this fine. Their athletes will get through it. You know, we're going to hear the whining of the no racing. I, I whine myself. I like going to the races. You know, I like seeing you guys or seeing my athletes. Um, um, but yeah, I think like it, it is, it's going to like the, we coach humans. There's a lot of global stress. I have three kids in my house. And I'm sort of tracking their well-being. you know, and I, I, I use this analogy that like if, if we're a table as a human, there's like four legs, you know, we have like a job that we hope doesn't horrible. We have a spouse. We hope that we kind of like a, a fair bit. Um, we have our other extracurriculars and then sport for us is the, is the fourth leg right now. That leg is like tippy and broken and a little shattered. And so the table that's our overall well being is not, is not stable. Um, so yeah, like back to like what Jason said, like we want to keep them fit enough and just tired enough that like we don't have to like backpedal too, too hard. Um, and so to like a new coach, I'd be like, be okay doing less with somebody right now. You know, be okay with having, having a flex day on a Sunday and letting them go canoe with their kids or go to the beach and stand up paddleboard or whatever. Um, and, and um, you know, because like I said, that fourth word, that sustainability is important. That like, if there's no racing in 2020, can they sustain to race in 2021 and 2022 and 2023? And so um, 
yeah, I'm always preaching that to both people I coach. And, and I don't know about you, Marilyn or, or Justin, I coach a few people who coach. Mm -hmm. So I'm always like kind of watching what they're doing on the periphery. And I'm just like, you know, um, you know, are they kind of following my lead here? And I don't, you know, there's no extra charge. I don't charge them a fee to sort of coach mentor them. But I'm like, gosh, I hope they're sort of listening to what I'm saying here is like, do some fun adventures. Like, you know, bike packing's huge, gravel's huge, uh, big ultra endurance, like mountain bike races. I'm the same as Justin. Swim and bike do as much as you kind of want that's silly. On the run, you know, it's, it's, you know, you, it's, you have to have some level of uh, control there because, you know, when you hear most injuries, obviously in sports, it's, it's running based injuries. But um, yeah, I think that the information thing for me is huge. I, I feel like people could, a new coach could really come out of this period with a better overall coaching sort of um, playbook. It's not just, triathlon coaching you know that it's like we coach athletes some of them will pick up a weight at some point some of them will go for a gravel ride and you know in boulder at some point like can we guide them through all that with our knowledge because I, when i first started coaching we kind of had this like peripheral group of people right like you send this guy to the strength coach this guy your pt guy this guy to the bike shop now i think a modern coach has to know a fair bit about a lot of that because people are looking they're going to pay you a premium fee and they want knowledge from you right like if i say oh, i don't know about gravel bikes or i don't know about you know, modern strength and conditioning modalities, like, sure, they'll go find someone, but it just dilutes myself as a coach. So I want to sort of have that knowledge. And that's come from reading books and, and going to seminars and stuff like that, or even syncing up with other coaches, you know, picking other coaches' brains about, you know, talking to Matt about Olympic weightlifting, you know. Speaking of which, my USAW clinic was canceled this year because of COVID. So um, wow. unless you were coming out to Maine to present, I, you wouldn't have been my presenter. But yeah, those are the things that, like, me as a coach, like, I've always sought out continuing education not to make myself a better triathlon coach just to make myself a better coach right. you know yeah. and so um yeah that'd probably be my guidance anything to add to that justin uh i mean i i would say like if, if i can finish on a on a optimist optimistic note um uh, we have a mutual friend colleague dr jeff schilt mm -hmm. and um he was a is an orthopedic surgeon and at one point was very competitive athlete in Ironman, Leadville events, these types of things. And, but one thing that he did is, you know, he cycled his competitiveness. So he, he, he had years where, you know, he was going to go to Kona and, you know, try and win his age group in an Ironman and, you know, go to go Hawaii and go full in, you know, and then it would be followed up by a year where he was having a little more fun, um, you know, and racing locally or maybe not at all. The main thing is he's never shut it down. He didn't have this like, I'm either all in or all out. He basically just had, there's certain years where I'm going to be highly competitive and then there's going to be times where I'm having fun. Flip side, if you look at, you know, historically, um, like Mark Allen's last win in Hawaii followed a year off. You know, so at the tail end of his career, he decided he needed a year off, came back, won. You know, Dave Scott's second place at 42 was after a long break. So there's been these times where people have had interruptions to their lives, um, athletically or otherwise, that have ended up being a saving grace or just good. I mean, maybe they would have been good anyways. We don't know. But I think, you know, there's, you know, keep it ticking over and it will come back. And we may not know what the upsides are to this, but there's going to be some. And we're going we're gonna to watch certain people succeed, and we're going to look back, and we're going to go into what they did, what their mindset was, how they dealt with everything, and we're going to learn from that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so hang in there. This too shall end. We will be back out there. We will race. We will go faster than ever. Yeah. Uh, and great things will happen. That's an awesome way to close out for sure. And I, the only thing I would add to all of this is, you know, as coaches, is we always have to remember it's our responsibility to keep um, protecting people and developing them and educating them. And that doesn't change whether there's races or there's not. Uh, so whether they're going to events or they're in this for five years, two years, 10 years, or 20 years, our job is to keep, you know, pushing them along to develop, to be a better version of themselves every, every week, every day, every month, every year, and, and just keep getting better. And then our next job is to protect them and make sure that they, um, you know, stay, stay safe and, and, 
and stay happy and keep enjoying it and keeping and remembering why they got in this in the first place. So thank you so much guys for your time. I know this was a huge block of your time, so I appreciate it. I, um, you know, I think these are important conversations and I love getting together with other coaches just to chat. Like I said, I think as athletes, we're always happy to get together and chat about our training, but it's, you don't find too many top coaches that are willing to, to get together and chat too much too often, maybe once a year. So I appreciate you taking the time and would love to do this again sometime. And um, yeah, so thanks. Thank and you. We'll definitely, you. we'll definitely be getting Thank you, together. Thank you, Marilyn. Together. Thanks, Marilyn. Cheers, Bye, guys. guys. Bye. Cheers.